a country where some take pride in their wine. French wines are the world's best, but Moldovan wines are not much different from them. Others have to sell their kidneys to support their families. But I needed money. Now, because of the money, my health is gone. In the first year of independence, the country went through a civil war. Nobody believed that war was possible at the end of the 20th century. Moldova could have yet become another former Soviet Republic to experience a color revolution. What will be the outcome of the protracted crisis in the country? What future course will it choose for itself? Many inside and outside Moldova are eager to know the answer to those questions. April the 7th, 2009, central Chisinau, the capital of Moldova. Several young people made their way to the rooftop of the presidential residence, took down the national flag, and in its place raised the European Union's flag. Protesters announced that a revolution had taken place in Moldova and the president had fled the country. President Vladimir Voronin was addressing the nation from his second floor office at the presidential residence. The ones behind these barbaric so-called demonstrations, whose interests they serve and who benefit from them, are only too obvious. We will certainly find out who has planned and masterminded these disturbances. How much for the Moldovan flag, please? Andre, a student at the Kitchenau Polytechnic, was among those who stormed the government buildings. He had joined a rally without any idea of how it might work out in the end. At the time, the young man was sure the police had deliberately allowed protesters to seize the parliament building and set it on fire. As you can see now, police are well equipped. But at that time, they were ill prepared to deal with such things. There were only 20 or 30 policemen on hand. They certainly couldn't have coped, but I'm sure there was a special purpose unit nearby. If they had used force, everybody would have gone home right away. Meanwhile, preparations for widespread unrest were underway throughout Chisinau. The Slavonic University, Chisinau's only Russian language institution of higher learning, was the source of greatest concern. It was feared that crowds might go on the rampage there. By midday, a large mob of nationalists had gathered in front of the university. Students were determined to defend their university and by any means possible. We did start worrying after learning that a crowd was heading here. We set about getting the hoses. We intended to use them as a last resort if they came here. The fact is that high school children, as well as university students, come here to study. On that day, April the 7th, many believe that another so-called color revolution was unfolding in downtown Chisinau. Several former Soviet republics had already shared the same fate. Everybody expected pro-Western politicians to come to power on the back of protests against communist president Vladimir Voronin. But the following morning, everything fell into place. Voronin had emerged victorious. If that evening somebody had resolved to ask youngsters in the crowd why and for whose sake they had come there, and what they knew about the outcome of the election. I am certain that 99% could not have answered those questions. Our discussion today will focus on what caused the events of April the 7th, 2009 and their aftermath. Our guest is Vitalia Pavlyuchenko, leader of the National Liberal Party. The leader of the ultra-right pro-Romanian party, Vitalia Pavlyuchenko, is rarely invited to speak over the radio. Her National Liberal Party's manifesto echoes the motto of the people who rampage through parliament, 
Moldova and Romania are a single country. We want to join NATO and the European Union. That's the position of the National Liberal Party. But that can only be achieved through a union with Romania. This should be done without delay. We do not hesitate to voice what's on the minds of very many people in our society. The town of Saroki, 200 kilometers from Chisinau. It is the informal capital of the Romani people in Moldova. It stands on the high bank of the Dniester River. Its Romani population is nearly 20,000. Artur Cerari is a Romani baron. He needs to be in the know about the problems facing all Romani families, help them deal with them and air their grievances to the authorities. Although most people in Soroki changed their old cars for plush German and Japanese makes, Artur prefers to drive his old Soviet-made Zhiguli car. Saraki is the mecca of all Romani of the former Soviet Union. This fact affects their culture, civilization and traditions. The cradle of the Romani people is here. Romani traditions are honored in Saraki. The Baron enjoys public respect. Romani seek advice from him on any matter of importance, whether they intend to build a house or give a name to a baby. Hello, hello. He looks like the Baron. <laughs> the Dniester is in the shape of a horseshoe near Soroki. We settled on this blessed and sacred land more than 500 years ago. The large Benderi forest is 200 kilometers downstream the Dniester River. Yuri Apostolaki, a businessman, is the most important person here. Yuri breeds hogs. The ex-president of Moldova and big-time businessmen have been known to join him on hunting expeditions in the forest. But nobody has offered help in resolving his main problem. His hogs are in one country, but his office in the forest area he administers is in another. This road here was a dividing line between the two warring parties. The Moldovan volunteers were here, the Transnistria ones were on that side. The part of the Moldavian Republic on the left bank of the Dniester declared its independence, even before the breakup of the Soviet Union was officially recognized. The fact of the matter is that what is now called Transdenista became part of Moldavia when it was a Soviet Republic. Chisinau did not recognize the self-proclaimed Transdenista Republic. After Moldavia achieved independence, a tense political standoff degenerated into an armed conflict. The first shots were fired in the spring of 1992. By the summer of 1992, massive hostilities had already broken out. The bitterest fighting took place in the Transdniester town of Benderi, an enclave on the right bank of the Dniester River. In that small forest over there, they set fire to the military hardware. And by that monument in the distance, I remember that there were two busloads of dead bodies. Vyacheslav Malchakov and his mother often come to the bridge over the Dniester. It was on this patch that the bloodiest clashes between Moldovan troops and Transdniester volunteers took place. Vyacheslav served in the Russian 14th Army deployed in Transdniester. His father served in a Cossack unit in Benderi. The Russian soldiers had to maintain neutrality, even though Moldovan troops constantly fired on their positions. It was then that Vyacheslav decided to join his father's unit. 
I told him I was going to take part. I said, if you don't allow me to join your unit, I will sign up for another. So he took me on, because he knew that I would at least be close at hand. Moldova's leaders insisted they were not at war with the self-proclaimed republic. Rather, they were trying to establish law and order. In reality, what happened in the summer of 1992 was a full-blown military standoff on the verge of becoming the bloodiest conflict in the territory of the former Soviet Union. Everybody waited to see which side the Russian troops would take. So much well, there's a huge misunderstanding. The Arab awakening is often referred to as revolutions in the Arab Middle East. There can be no doubt something important is occurring in this region. More than a month in one of the most extreme environments on the planet. This is Antarctica, and people have to be aware that they are far away from civilization. Sean Thomas discovers what makes Antarctica so special and attractive for many. The wildlife in Antarctica is both unique and fragile. Expedition to the bottom of the earth on RT. Permission free. Accreditation free. Transport charges free. Arrangement free. Risk free. Stereotypes free. Download free broadcast quality video for your media projects at freevideo.rt.com. The village of Krikova is a Kishinev suburb. Moldova's principal treasure is tucked away underground. Some 40 million liters of wine was kept to mature here. Demand generates supply. Now you can find French, Hungarian, Romanian and Moldovan barrels here. Each contains up to one ton of wine. Wine likes barrels made of oak. White wines are normally aged for 18 months or two years. Some are kept for only six months. Red wines are kept here for two, three or four years. The labyrinth is 120 kilometers long. This winery looks like a town complete with streets and avenues. It's the only place of its kind in the world. People here are not prone to modesty when talking about the miles upon miles of tunnels hiding thousands of barrels of red and white wine. I would say that it's the eighth wonder of the world. There was a time when winemaking was an important part of the Moldavian economy. It first came under attack when Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev declared war on hard drinking. Vineyards over the total area of thousands of hectares were cut down. After Moldova achieved independence, the industry could not be restored to previous levels, either in terms of quantity or, more importantly, quality. Moldova's biggest customer, Russia, stopped importing its produce at the turn of the century. Moldovan wine no longer conforms to strict Russian sanitary standards. Moreover, the Russian market was drowned in produce from European winemakers. French wines are the world's best, but Moldovan wines are not much different from them. Moldova is situated at the same latitude as France and the sea is only a short distance away. So Russia certainly lost out in this case. Does your waist ache? Sometimes. This is the post-surgery wound, the stitch and the scar. The doctor at this hospital in the village of Menjir has catered to several patients like Grigori. People in the surrounding villages might report about a hundred cases of this kind. They share a common fate. Some have sold one of their kidneys for money. Others were duped into selling them. 
criminal gangs would spot potential donors in Moldova and take them to Turkey for back alley surgery. We had 13 people in our village who went through this. And one of them has already died of kidney failure. Selling their kidneys for money in order to be able to support their families was the only option open to most of them. Employment in Moldova's regions is hard to come by. The villagers were paid from $1,500 to $3,000 for the operation. I heard that one kidney is worth $95,000, around 100000 They just cheated us. I shouldn't have gone to Turkey, but I needed money. Now, because of the money, my health is gone. There's nothing I can do. I can't go back and change it. All I can do is go on. Grigori spent the $500 he was paid for his kidney in Turkey a long time ago. The money was just about enough for minor house repairs and clothes for his family. Despite protests by his doctor, Grigori is again toying with the idea of going abroad to look for temporary employment. He sees no other way to get money for his family. According to various estimates, the money Moldovans have earned in foreign countries accounts for approximately one-fourth of the Republic's GDP. Up to one million citizens of Moldova permanently reside outside the country. My older daughter wanted to go to college, and I had no money. I had to get some money for her education, but eventually she did not go. Artur Cerari, the Romani baron, has his hands full now. Moldova's Romani have been increasingly involved in the country's political life. Once Artur Cerari even ran for president, but he says it was more a showy political gesture than anything else. Nowadays, the Romani people take politics seriously. They have founded a political party and expect to get several seats in parliament after elections. We Romani always understood the meaning of politics. We knew much about it, but we never tried to get involved in it. This is what the political campaigning of the newly founded Romani party looks like. Folk songs and dances in front of government headquarters are the best publicity stunt for the new political association. However, the deputies at a session of the Moldovan parliament nearby paid no attention to the Romani flash mob. The country has been in a state of political crisis for a long time. Communist President Vladimir Voronin did retain power after the events of April the 7th, 2009, but his party lost subsequent elections. Deputies in the Republic's parliament have so far failed to agree on a future course for the country because none of the parliamentary parties has the necessary majority of votes. Some народ, some... The people of Moldova want to hear nothing of any merger with anybody. Sovereignty is increasingly becoming an integral part of the normal life of Moldovan society and the Moldovan state. Businessman Yuri Apostolaki has been a member of parliament for some time. In modern-day Moldova, it is impossible to do business of any significance without political assistance. Yuri Apostolaki runs a small enterprise. He is a rare example of a successful businessman in Moldova. Yuri breeds hogs, creates jobs, and protects the natural environment. Things would be even better for him were it not for a border cutting his forest in two. I find it hard to draw a dividing line between Bandaria and Moldova, or between the left bank and the right bank. I still do believe this is one country, and I regret what has been going on on those banks. The narrow Dniester River divides Moldova from the unrecognized republic. But the political and economic gap between the two countries is much wider. Chisinau and Tiraspol have no diplomatic relations. There are no direct telephone communications between them. Transdniester has its own currency, economy and political system. There. Just look at him. Come here. He treats me as one of his own. 
Igor Smirnov has been at the helm of the unrecognized republic for more than 20 years. He is unwilling to talk about the 1992 war and prefers to demonstrate the republic's economic progress. There will always be an adequate supply of food because people know how to work this land. They can support themselves without outside help. The problem is, where can we sell what we produce? Despite all efforts, the population of the unrecognized republic has dropped from 700,000 to 400,000 since the armed conflict in Transnistria 20 years ago. Some have moved to Moldova, others to Ukraine, still more to Russia. This is the result of widespread unemployment. Most of the leading industrial plants built in the Soviet Union have been shut down. Benderi is over there. Moldova is beyond Benderi. That is where the fighting took place. Reminders of those dreadful days are still evident in the enclave town on the right bank of the Dniester. The pock-marked walls of the administration building bear traces of bullets. Locals take people on guided tours to show the positions of Moldovan sharpshooters. The snipers killed off civilians because they couldn't hit the troops. But it didn't matter if it was friend or foe. The only thing they cared about was the body count. The more people they killed, the higher their pay was. Nobody at the Russian 14th Army stationed in Transdenista could stop the bloodshed. The army's commander, General Liebed, declared Benderi a demilitarized zone. Today, the Russian peacekeeping force is about the only guarantor of peace there. More than 2,000 people on both sides lost their lives during that armed conflict. Nobody expected any hostilities to kick off here. Nobody believed that war was possible at the end of the 20th century. On the other side of the border, a former Transdenista volunteer, Vyacheslav Malchakov, reflects on what caused that brief war on his way to his mother's house. Armed people entering your home triggers your self-defense reflex. People were defending their homes. But there is no hostility now. We meet many Moldovans over a glass of wine. They are normal people, like anyone else. In the autumn of 1992, Vacheslav Malchakov's father went missing. That was when heavy fighting had already come to an end. My husband was abducted when he and another man went to inspect the territory. There was a lull in fighting at the time. It was clear that it would soon stop altogether. They abducted both of them. I tried to find my husband for a year and three months. Each summer, war veterans and relatives of the fallen come to cemeteries on both sides of the Dniester to light candles. Scores of people have gathered in central Chisinau for the anniversary of the raid on the parliament building. They too lit candles. It is noteworthy, though, that only a few of those who had been involved in those events turned up. In April 2007, Dmitri was poised to defend his university from a crowd of thugs. Today, he takes his first steps into show business. He writes songs for up-and-coming Moldavian singers. After quitting university, he spent a year in Europe. There he realized that his country is his home. I am a patriot of my country. My friends and relatives live here. This is my land. There is no point to linger in Europe. What can we give Europe apart from wine? Those turbulent events died down a long time ago, but the feeling of resentment is still with me. Today, I still can't figure out what's going on. Our society has become insensitive to politics. Andrei was among those who wreaked havoc in the parliament building two years ago. 
Today, he is of a much more peaceful disposition. Since then, he has graduated from university and given up politics. Now he has other priorities. My friend and I have founded a small organization in our town. It is called Ecochim. We are in the business of making minor ecological projects. But they are only small projects because we are still in the initial stages. A group of young people gathering in the center of the Moldovan capital call their act the Hyde Park Project, a reference to the British tradition of open-air public debates. Anyone can air their views on the political situation in the country, speaking through a microphone. The project was launched hot on the heels of the events of April 2009. Initially, people queued for a chance to speak up, but their enthusiasm rapidly petered out. Nowadays, passers-by are more likely to ignore the speakers.